Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Ryan Devadoc. I'm the supervisor for the planning, zoning, and land use unit here in Oakland County. I'd like to welcome you today to the virtual planners gathering on accessory dwelling units. I want to have a few reminders. Uh, the meeting is being recorded, and so we ask that you mute your audio and turn your camera off. Um, and also, when you have questions, please use the chat function in Zoom and direct your questions to Jim Schaefer. Jim will mod uh, moderate the question and answer period after today's presentations. So today's discussion, we're gonna be talking about accessory dwelling units, uh, the history and implementation of two of them in, in uh, two uh, communities in, in Michigan, uh, talk about the successes and challenges with them, and then obviously answer some questions at the end. Um, we're, well, we're pleased to have Sean Winter from the planning director from Traverse City um, here with us and also Chris Cheng with uh, City of Ann Arbor. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Chris and he will begin his presentation. Thank you. Okay, give me one second. To... Let's make sure that my screen is being shown. Okay, can you see my screen? Excellent. Okay, um, as was previously mentioned, my name is Chris Chang. I'm with the city of Ann Arbor. I've been here for 26 years, so I have seen the beginning and the ends of, of ADUs in the city. Uh, I'd like to welcome the people of Oakland County. It sounds like we have some other vi visitors from outside the county, so welcome. Um, and let's start the presentation. Uh, maybe just for clarification, Amendment to Chapter 55 UDC, that's, that's short for our Unified Development Code, which is essentially, it's our zoning code. Okay, so what is an ADU? An accessory dwelling unit is a second smaller dwelling unit, either developed of an existing single family house, such as a basement, attic, or addition, or as part of an accessory structure, such as a converted garage or carriage house. And as you can see on the right-hand uh, side of the graphic, you know, they can be in the attic, basement, you know, and also in detached accessory uh, structures, you know, such as a garage. So the histories of ADUs in, in Ann Arbor, it's, a, it's an interesting one, and I'm gonna try to go through those as quickly as possible. But in general, the 2002 city council denied our ADU proposals, changes to the ordinance. 2016, so 14 years later, we brought it back and got it approved, but it was still fairly restrictive. 2019, we tried to unlock some of those restrictions and that again was denied. And finally in 2021, we did get uh, those amendments approved. But going back to 2002, um, there was only two applicants in 20 years for ADUs in the city. The reason for that is how restrictive they were. They required special exception use, so that's approval by the Planning Commission. They were not permitted in detached accessory structures, so not permitted in garages. The owner must occupy one of the dwelling units. Only their relatives could stay there, so it truly was a mother-in-law uh, or a granny flat. And they could not charge rent, and they were only allowed in the R1 single-family districts and at least three off-street parking spaces provided. And I can tell you, going back and doing some research, that we had to, one of them of those two applicants that were approved they had to go to the zoning board of appeals and reduce their their parking count because they didn't have the parking the three parking spaces that were required so how do we begin our accessory dwelling unit um, process well we are in ann arbor it's a college town so the very first thing we did was well let's compare ourselves to how they're doing it out in other college towns and most of these college towns as you see listed they're west of here, whether it's Aspen, Boulder, Seattle, Evanston. And we just wanted to determine where did we stack up uh, with other uh, university towns with accessory dwelling units? You know, were they conditional? Were they permitted? You know, how large could they be? You know, how much off street parking? So the columns kind of show where we stood in comparison to other um, communities, college communities. I will tell you my recollection of, the, uh, of this when we went to uh, city Council for approval, it went down in flames. And why did it go down in flames? Well, as you can see, uh, back then, you know, if you read the headlines, it says, act now to save cities, single family neighborhoods. 
And then it goes on to state, you should also have the right to choose to live in a low density, single family neighborhood. Unfortunately, the city council wants to take that right away from you. And that's not right. And I would say that my, my recollection is the number one response that we got from the community regarding these ADUs was they were completely fine with them, but there was no way they were going to have a college student living next to them. Uh, you know, for whatever reason, they felt like it was an intrusion on their privacy. So it went to city council. It was denied. And not only was it denied in 2002, they told us not to come back, do not do amendments, uh, you know, just drop it. Do not explore this uh, amendment, the amendments to the zoning code. So 14 years later, council directed the city planning commission to review and make changes to the ADU ordinance to increase affordable housing. Why? Well, accessory dwelling units increase the variety of housing opportunities available within the community by introducing new housing prototypes that represents the look and scale of single family neighborhoods. The addition of accessory dwelling units may increase opportunities for homeowners to age in place in either the main dwelling unit or the accessory apartment because the units may be rented out to provide added income. Accessory dwelling units can increase the number of smaller dwelling units to address declining household size. The decline in household size is attributed in part to a growing population of seniors and an increase in single person households. Accessory dwelling units can be more affordable than other new dwelling units because infrastructure, sewer and water and land costs have already been absorbed by the main dwelling unit and are typically smaller in size. Likewise, ADUs support more efficient and sustainable use of existing housing stock and infrastructure. The addition of an accessory apartment can help first time home buyers leverage or mortgage Current homeowners retain a home after a change in financial circumstances, and ADUs might provide an affordable rental alternative in established neighborhoods where a person might not otherwise be able to afford to live. Now, I will say, when we started this in 2015, I told our planning director at that time, there's no way this is getting approved. I had my doubts. I knew what happened back in 2002. I was skeptical, but guess what? I was wrong, and I was happy to be wrong. So. When we started the, the revisions to the ordinance again in 2015, uh, we had our ordinance revisions committee. That means we took it to our planning commission to see what would they like to see changed in the, the ordinance. Uh, we continued public engagement. Uh, in this case, we split the city up into four quadrants. So we would go out to the neighborhoods in the Northeast, West, Central, and South side of the city and continue to meet with them about their concerns with the possible ADU uh, amendments. And then we followed up with city council and planning commission approval. And we, were, we had everything listed out on our website. And it's to this day, if you want to visit the Ann Arbor's uh, planning website, go to the ADUs, there's videos, there's information, there's the history of how all of this uh, was uh, reviewed and approved. So what were the proposed changes to lessen restrictions to encourage construction of ADUs in Ann Arbor? Well, we changed it from a special exception use to a permitted use. So no longer had to go to planning commission. Uh, we allowed ADUs and existing accessory structures. This one is a little tricky because you had to have an existing garage on your site in 2016 when we approved this, and that garage had to be a minimum of 200 square feet. So you were not allowed to just build a garage and build an ADU at the time. Uh, we allowed for rental to non-relatives as well as a, a, the ability to charge rent. Uh, we reduced the parking requirement. We put a cap on the minimum lot size of 5,000 square feet, that which would allow an ADU of 600 square feet. So your minimum, your minimum lot had to be 5,000 square feet. If your lot happens to be over 7,200 square feet, you could do up to an 800 square foot ADU. Uh, leasing an ADU less than 30 days is prohibited. We did not, uh, you know, being a college town, we did not want short-term rentals. And then we also required a deed restriction that runs with the land to prevent selling the ADU separately. So we did a little bit of research. Uh, this is, this is our, our zoning map of all the R1A through R1E. As you can see, kind of in the center of the city, that's the U of M campus. So you don't see a lot of the single family uh, zoning around U of M campus and North campus. We found that for the majority, 96% of our single family lots were greater than 5,000 square feet. So they were eligible. And not only that, 86% of them were homestead. That means they were, they were owner occupied. So we knew we had a lot of, a lot of properties that would, that would qualify for the ADUs. Well, from 2016 to 2021, we got approximately 23 ADUs that were either built 
or were under or under zoning review. So we were averaging less than five per year. This was not, you know, the boom that we were thinking about ADUs in the city of Ann Arbor to address affordable housing. So to increase the number of ADUs in the city, additional amendments were proposed. And in 2019, these amendments were denied by council. What were these amendments? In short, we opened it up that all of a sudden you could do you could do ADUs in any residential uh, zoning district. So not just R1, you could do it in R2, R3, R4, which are duplex, townhouse, and multifamily residential. Um, an ADU is permitted as, as or within any legally conforming accessory building. So all of a sudden, if you had a garage, we didn't care what the size of it was, you could put it in there. Uh, we got rid of the one dwelling occupied by the owner. You did not have to record a deed restriction any longer. Uh, it seemed like a lot of questions came up, but well, how many people can rent in these districts? Again, it's only two unrelated persons plus their offspring can live in a single housekeeping unit uh, or may occupy the ADU or when a functional family is allowed by special exception use. So we've had cases where let's say, you know, uh, five, uh, I think five Jesuit priests wanted to live together. We approved it. Special exception use, by all means, go for it. Uh, the minimum 30-day lease was kept in place. And again, we dropped it. It said 600 square feet ADU. So uh, on 70, less than a 7,200 square foot lot. So in other words, all lots were now uh, uh, eligible for the ADU. So if you had a smaller lot than the previous 5,000 square feet, you weren't, you are now. Uh, we also dropped the one parking space for ADU if within one quarter mile from bus stop. You know, we've got maps again, essentially every single family home or most of these residential uh, units are within the AA or the Ann Arbor Area Transportation Authority. So there is a bus stop within a quarter, quarter mile of all of these uh, single family neighborhoods. So to kind of simplify it, uh, I think for the public and, and I think you out, the viewers out there, it was kind of simplified with the proposed changes that we made. Essentially, are single family unit properties eligible? As you can see, they were in the current code, the proposed code, and even for the detached. Are multifamily use properties eligible? They are not, but it gets a little confusing. That's because multifamily would be something that has more than a single family unit on it. So if you happen to be zoned R4 uh, and you had a single family there, which is a, an apartment type of, of zoning district, yes, you could have an ADU there. Are they allowed in single family and R2A districts? They are. Are they allowed in residential zoning districts? Uh, yes, they, they weren't uh, in other zoning districts, but the changes for the proposed code, we did allow them now in the R2, R3, and R4. Uh, does the property have to live on site? They didn't previously, they do now. Deed restriction, they used to, no longer. Uh, is a minimum lot size required? They used to, no longer. It is additional parking uh, required. They used to, not any longer. So we have a table in our zoning chart that shows where if it's permitted as an accessory use, as you can see, it previously was allowed in the R1s all the way up to the R1Es. We had changed it. Now they're allowed in the R2s, R3s, and the R4s districts. So why did we allow those in the multifamily districts? Well, as you can see again, the center of the city where the U of M is and kind of the Northeast area of the city where, where the North Campus is, you can see more of the, the multifamily and townhouse dwelling districts closer to, to campus. And we also went through and, and did our, our housing counts. And you can see that there's, there really aren't a whole lot of total parcels. I mean, we have 2,519 duplex type parcels, around 1,000 R2A and R2B that were actually homestead where they were living there. R3, again, R4, less than 3,000 uh, homesteaded. So, you know, as far as a percentage of, of the households, there weren't a whole lot in these multifamily uh, districts surrounding the university campus uh, would be eligible, but we surely wanted to at least, you know, open this up and try to get more ADUs uh, in those, those districts. So what is our final count? Well, some, from 2021 present, uh, approximately 16 ADUs were either built or under zoning review. Once we made the changes, you know, from the 23 that were previously approved, we have a total of 39 uh, that are in the city. So the neighbors did have a lot of concerns, but they were pretty much unfounded. 
And I've, I've not received any complaints either from neighbors regarding these ADUs being rented out. So what were some of the frequently asked questions that came up uh, during the process? How does the creation of an ADU impact property tax assessment? The primary residential exemption is based on the percentage occupied by the owner. The unit would be assessed similar as a two-family rental. The assessment would also increase for extra finishing kitchens. Uh, what are the neighborhood notification requirements? What was previously mentioned, you no longer have to go through the site plan or planning commission and have public hearings, but you are required to have building permits. And also uh, that has to be registered with our rental housing department for inspections every 30 months. Uh, we've already discussed how many ADUs have been proposed since 2016. Again, and you know, it comes up often, what's the definition of a family? How many can live in the ADU, uh, in the R1 and the R2? It's a total of four plus their offspring. In the detached accessory structure, it's two. And if they happen to have offspring, but if you have, you know, additional questions, I'm happy to answer. You know, you know what the definition of family is: how many people can live in these units. Um, again, here's here's what an accessory dwelling unit that was recently built. It's in a garage. It's a product behind the existing house. You can see the the finishes, how beautiful uh, these ADUs can be. I would say the one issue that we've had or the one I, I think hurdle for not constructing additional ADUs is cost. I hear that more than any other reason why they're not being built. It's because they're costing between $100,000 and $200,000, depending on the finish, you know, materials, uh, interest rates have gone up, labor costs, you name it. So they are very, very expensive uh, to construct. And I'm open to any questions you may have. As a reminder, uh, please put your, your questions in the chat box, and I think Jim will be moderating. And I will now turn it over to Sean from Traverse City. Yes, thank you, Chris. I'm going to go ahead and get started again. My name is Sean Winter. I'm the planning director for the city of Traverse City. Um, and today I'll be telling you our story of accessory dwelling units. And having just heard Chris's, you're going to see that they probably tracked in a similar fashion up here. So a little bit about our community. Um, we're pretty small geographically. We're just under nine square miles. We have about 16,000 people living in the city limits, but about 150,000 in the general area. We have about 6,400 dwelling units. Um, one interesting stat that came out last census is almost 11% of our dwelling units don't own an automobile up here. So it's um, a small city with a lot of walking and biking and public transit for its, for its size. We have a large tourism and service-based industry sectors up here. Um, right behind that is going to be our medical and our educational sectors. We also have uh, significant daily and seasonal swings um, in population and visitors. So right now we're feeling it. Everyone's coming back for the summer up north up here. But even during the day, we notice that. And so our wastewater treatments plant monitors flow rates, and they estimate that on a given day in the wintertime when the tourists don't, aren't here, we're operating at about 39,000 people each day. So more than double the population that lives here um, is present. So here's our geography of our city. Again, it's bisected by Boardman Lake. It has the Boardman River running through its downtown. We sit on the west arm of Grand Traverse Bay primarily. We do have some access to the east arm. Down in the bottom right there, you'll see that that big gray area is our airport. It takes up a significant portion of our city. They recently became their own airport authority, so we have no jurisdiction over that land anymore. And looking more closely at just our residential districts, we have four. Our R1A and our R1B are our single family districts. They only differ um, in lot size. R2 is our two family district and R3 is our multifamily. So residential land takes up about 35% of our city with our single family occupying about 83% of the residential districts. So a little bit about our ADU history. Uh, we allowed ADUs in 1999, um, but they had to be temporary and you needed a special land use permit. So that meant that you had to have um, approval by the planning commission and the city commission, both requiring a public hearing. And you had to have a demonstrated need to their pleasing in order to get approved. And what's even more challenging with these restrictions is that once that need was no longer present, you had to decommission that ADU and remove that investment. So if you had a family that, um, or your relative that needed care and you wanted to have them live with you and you invested in ADU, they could do so. But if they had to move into assisted living, you then had to take out either the kitchen or the bathroom component of that ADU. So with these restrictions and that time period, it resulted in only one accessory dwelling unit. 
Then from 20, 2007 to 2015, they piloted an overlay in one neighborhood. They removed the demonstrated need requirement and the requirement that it was only temporary. However, it still required a special land use permit that had to go through the planning commission and the city commission. So in that time period, which was about the same time as the previous, uh, we got three ADUs, so still not very significant. Then in 2015, the Planning Commission worked on a major ordinance overhaul. They made ADUs a use by right in all districts. However, it could only occupy a lot that had a single family home. So you couldn't do it with a duplex or anything like that. You had to have an annual license from the city. The max that they were going to issue each year was 10. That was to kind of control the concerns that it would uh, cause a rapid change to the neighborhoods. The property itself needed to be significantly conforming to the current standards. Um, a minimal rental period of 90 days was instituted because we have a lot of pressures from short-term rentals and they were afraid that they would be used for that purpose. And the owner must live on site, either in the ADU or in the main dwelling. So some of the concerns that were expressed as the Planning Commission went through that process included parking, um, the perceived negative impact of the density increase on our infrastructure, uh, parking, um, nuisance issues such as trash and noise, parking, um, changes to the neighborhood character, again, parking, short-term rentals, parking, privacy, parking, and then the erosion of exclusive single-family neighborhoods. So what's interesting with our parking issue is that in 2021, the city commission approved removing all minimum parking requirements for residential uses, but people still provide parking because you're not allowed to park in the alley right-of-ways and you're not allowed to park on the streets overnight. So instead of having an arbitrary parking minimum, um, the, the property owner determines what their need needs to be. So in 2018, the city went through a number of uh, minor amendments to the ordinance to address some concerns that were popping up as these uh, ADUs were being built. One was they increased the limit to 15 per year because at that point, the limit of 10 was getting maxed out and we had a waiting list. So we knew there was more demand and a lot of the fears that were predicted work materializing. So the city commission supported them and agreed to increase it to 15. Um, the rest were more design elements. So only one entrance on the front facade is allowed on a house if it's a um, inclusive ADU within the primary structure. Exterior stairs in that case are prohibited from the front facade. They have to be on the side or rear. The ADU itself can't be any larger than 800 square feet. Now, a couple notes on that. Um, if it's a detached ADU, we have regulations for accessory buildings that come into effect in that the gross square footage of the accessory building can't be more than 75% of the gross square footage of the primary structure. Um, so if you have a really big structure, you could have a really big accessory building. However, the ADU component cannot be more than 800 square feet. We also do not measure the stairwell when we calculate the 800 square feet, if it's on a second floor, since that's not usable space nor do we calculate the area where the floor to ceiling height is less than six feet. So when you get towards the edges and the, the roof pitch is coming down, we don't count that. The maximum height is 25 feet or the height of the principal building, whichever is less. And you're required to use similar building materials, design elements, roof pitches, et cetera, as the principal building. And the reason that they really focused on these design elements is we got some pretty wonky ADUs pop up initially. So here in the foreground, you can see an accessory dwelling unit where in the background is the principal structure. There's no design continuity whatsoever between those two structures. And we are also getting some pretty large ones. So on the left, you can see an ADU that was built under the 2015 standards where we didn't limit the area compared to on the right, the principal structure, which is dwarfed by this ADU. But finally, starting in 2015, we started to get some success with ADUs. So since 2015, we've had a total of 89 ADUs. You can see in 2015, 16, and 17, those first three years when we had the limit of 10, we were maxing out with the exception of 2017, where one of the um, permitted ADUs never got constructed. So even with 15 ADUs allowed, we haven't hit that max. Um, and so far this year, about halfway through, we're only at about five ADUs. Most of our ADUs end up being detached as opposed to attached. So 80 of the 89 are detached. Um, our residential areas are primarily platted with alleys. If you have an alley, you're not allowed to get a curb cut. So this drives most parking um, and garage structures to be in the back off the alley. Um, most people 
prefer to have the ADU in that scenario where it's above the garage towards the back of the uh, lot so that you have greater sense of separate units between the two properties. Um, and the other thing is our when it comes to siting on the property, we have much more forgiving uh, setbacks when it comes to accessory buildings and a principal structure. So sometimes the setbacks with a principal structure create limitations when one wants to build an addition to accommodate the ADU. So with these new design elements in place, we started seeing some or seeing the ADUs that were coming online looking much more compatible with the principal house and therefore the neighborhood around it. So here in the foreground, you have the ADU that was built. You can't quite see the house in the background because of the vegetation, but you'll see that the roof pitches and the color and the siding material are the same. Same thing in this scenario. So the the building closer is a two-story accessory building, so it's a two-car garage below with an ADU upstairs, separate entrance to the ADU and stairwell off to the side of the house. Most ADUs that we are seeing are being placed above a two-car garage like we have in this example. This one's really quite massive, but again, this is tied to the overall size of the house. Um, it was one of our more premier historical houses from the founders of Traverse City, so it's, it's quite large. Now on waterfront properties, we allow our accessory buildings to be on the street side, so here we have the ADU detached but nearer to the street, but again, same architectural elements. Um, here's a detached one set behind with the primary structure in the front. We even um, apply this, of course, with the more modern looking houses that we get. So um, this one has a flat roof for the primary structure, which is on the right. So the accessory structure had to have a flat roof as well and kind of work in the same colors and materials. Uh, and then again, here we have one in the back that does not have an alley. So it does have a curb cut for the ADU and the garage, but the same type of gingerbread detailing is included in both structures. And another one. So when it comes to ADUs, our planning commission for the last few years has been wrestling with how to increase more missing middle housing in the area. Like most communities throughout the state, we're really struggling with having enough adequate housing. Um, so they've gone through a bunch of different changes, if you will, and modifications to our standards to help accommodate more houses coming online. So they actually held a planning commission public hearing last week and recommended a, a host of changes to the city commission related to housing. So in general, they recommended now allowing, allowing duplexes in our R1 single family district, triplexes and quadplexes in the R2 two family districts, reducing the minimum lot area and width, allowing two homes on a double lot without having to split it because a lot of lots have the area to be split and the frontage, but due to this location of the existing house, can't do so with the uh, required setbacks. Specifically with accessory dwelling units, they recommended eliminating, eliminating the annual cap, even though we haven't hit the cap of 15, given the housing need we have in the city, if we had 17 applicants come in and we acknowledge that ADUs are an appropriate residential type for our, for our community, would it be appropriate to tell two of those that they can't build it in a given year? The next one was to remove the owner occupancy requirement of the ADU allow duplexes, I'm oh, sorry, allow with duplexes in the R1 and then allow them with triplexes in the R2. So this whole suite of zoning amendments, the one that probably got the, the strongest amount of opposition was removing the owner occupancy requirement. Um, for some reason, people were fine with having a duplex in the R1 where both units were rented out, but for some reason, if there is a residential unit above a garage, they want an owner there. Now, this has created some unintended consequences because we do require owner occupancy. So for instance, we're dealing with the case right now where we have a couple that lives in the primary structure, they own the property and they have an ADU that a woman rents out. Now the wife and the couple, um, she's an Air Force reservist. And so she's been called up to duty. They have to move to Florida for the next three years. So they're gonna be renting out their house while they're gone because their plan is to come back. Well, that tenant in the ADU, once that lease ends, they have to vacate because the property will be no longer owner occupied. Similarly, a house in another part of the neighborhood um, had an ADU and a woman living in the house. She sold the house. Uh, the people that bought it bought it as a second home. So once the lease ran out on the ADU, that person had to leave. And now that dwelling unit is just sitting there empty. 
So one of the reasons the planning commission um, moved towards this kind of up zoning to allow missing middle housing is because it's kind of the historical development pattern of the city. So here's the 1943 zoning map when the city first began uh, regulating land uses. So all the blocks that are colored in are the blocks that allowed two or more dwelling units when we first started regulating our um, zoning districts. So at that time, exclusive single family zoning was not the, the norm, it, it really truly was the exception. And as a result, here in our residential districts, every one of these red uh, parcels is a, a lot that is a legal non-conforming parcel due to the fact that it has more dwelling units on that property than what is currently allowed. Now, these are just the ones that we have a non-conforming, um, sorry, what, I can't think of the word right now, uh, essentially a license that we have given them that they uh, voluntarily come in to get. We don't require that they get that, um, but a lot of times people will come in to get that non-conforming use certificate. There it is. Um, if they want to sell the property, insure it, or refinance because it ensures that that property can exist as it is. So to kind of wrap up, just some considerations. You know, ADUs are a great way to gently add housing to your residential districts. Um, I say gently because, like Chris in Ann Arbor, they don't pop up like weeds. And the biggest issue that we're hearing as well is the cost. We currently have one I was sharing with Chris and the team before everyone came on that's under construction. The gross square footage is 1,800 square feet. So it's got a garage on the bottom, ADU on the top, um, and it's costing her about $350,000 to build that. So um, the next thing would be don't regulate them to the point that people won't pursue building them. We saw that starting in 1999 when we had so many regulations like decommissioning it, uh, public hearings, things like that. People were dissuaded from actually uh, engaging in the construction of ADUs. I would say don't create requirements that are substantially above and beyond what applies to single family homes. Um, it started getting really tricky in 2018 when the planning commission was uh, reviewing some changes to the design standards because it started getting into the weeds of like, well, are we gonna design where windows can be placed on the ADU and things like that? But we don't do that to principal, uh, principal residential structures. You know, it's, it seems okay that the primary house can have windows that can look into the backyard of the neighbors, but they were worried about ADUs doing that. So again, I would say just kind of keep it congruent with one another. Um, consider eliminating your minimum dwelling size. So in many communities, that is the uh, one of the barriers to ADUs or simply exempt ADUs from that requirement. If you start going down this road, definitely listen to the community's concerns, engage with them often. It's, it's a change to their neighborhood and the places where we live, when there's change there, it really hits home. So just Take the time to be sure to hear them and their concerns. And, and when you're speaking with them, you know, frame the conversation on the external benefits that this housing can provide within the city. And again, I would just encourage you not to be afraid to allow them. As you saw with us, you can always amend to address the unforeseen outcomes. You're not going to be able to figure out every possible permutation out there. But again, they don't cause widespread transformation of the, the neighborhoods. So if, if something's not going right, you notice it right away, you can go ahead and address it. So again, thank you. Um, at this point, I'm gonna hand it back over to Jim, I believe. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Chris and Sean. Uh, excellent, uh, excellent presentation. Um, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, first up, and this will be for both of you. Um, have there been complaints or enforcement issues regarding ADU occupancies? Regarding their occupancy, as in maybe not staying the minimum duration, is what I'm assuming. At least that's how I'll answer it. Um, you know, when it comes to short term rentals, most of the ones that we are catching, we are catching in the single family homes. Um, and as we discussed earlier before the thing started, uh, neighbors pay attention to ADUs and they let us know right away if people aren't meeting the occupancy requirements. And I, I would also to respond as that's exactly why we have limitations on the size of the ADU, depending on the lot size. So typically they're between six and 800 square feet. So at most you might be able to get a two bedroom in there. And we write on the permits, you know, as we're reviewing and approving them, you know, no more than two unrelated uh, individuals could be living in the, the ADU. So again, to stress, it'll be your neighbors who turn you in if you're, you know, you're leasing this as a short-term rental, 
or there's more than two, you know, individuals living in that that ADU. So I've honestly, we have so few of them, but no, I've not received a whole lot of complaints as far as enforcement goes on the ADU. So just as a quick follow up, so parking, noise, nuisance, in generally, uh, no issues. No, no none. That, that well, only on game days, but that's for everyone. For when, everyone. You know, yeah. If you want to see the litter that's being thrown around on in U of M game days, but other than that, no. Okay. Uh, next question, uh, specifically to short-term rentals. Uh, how are they enforced in each one of your communities? Yeah, so we have a contract with a company called Host Compliance through Granicus. Um, they're a third party that we pay that just scrubs the internet, I think 70 to 80 websites, finding illicit postings. And then they have analysts that go through and um, try to identify the location by looking at past listings of properties in the area. And it's it's pretty pretty impressive what they're able to figure out. Like they'll see a picture from a short-term rental um, advertisement where through the window, you can see a, a very unique bay window on a street or house across the street rather. And they're able to start looking around with Google Street View and find that house and the angle and all that kind of stuff. The nice thing is we can go in there periodically, find all the ones that they flag as non-compliant we can hit a button that sends them all a letter to let them know that they need to come into compliance and stop doing this. And they go ahead and print it and mail it with those photos identifying their location as evidence printed on the back. So that's been pretty helpful. Um, we just started that this year. Uh, so we're catching a lot more than we ever have. But again, um, out of the probably 200 letters I've sent out this year, only one has been for an ADU. And that wasn't even a permitted ADU. It was a rogue ADU that someone built above a open space in a garage. So. And, and again, I think that's a good point that needs to be mentioned. There were ADUs in the city. They just weren't permitted. They just built them without permits and didn't get approval by our planning commission. So this was a great opportunity to actually hopefully encourage them to come in and get it licensed and have it inspected. So we do have a zoning enforcement, uh, zoning coordinator that's on staff. I don't, I haven't heard of too many uh, complaints or enforcement issues, but like Sean said, it's fairly simple to go on to VR, you know, VRBO or Airbnb. And we know if you're renting these out as short term doing U of M football games or something, and we'll start tracking and doing enforcement that way. Okay. Does Ann Arbor or Traverse City allow ADUs to be metered separately for water and sewer, or do they need to be tied to the meter of the principal dwelling? I, I can tell you from Ann Arbor's perspective, back in 2016, uh, when we approved the initial uh, ADU amendment, that uh, you were required to have a separate connection. So a separate water meter, separate sewer water. Uh, that was another huge, you know, it may have been thirty to $50,000 for the hookups while we weren't getting anybody applying. We did go coordinate with the engineering department. We've waived that now. You can be on the same meter um, with the, you know, kind of with a disclaimer, if there's any backups or any floods or anything that occur in the ADU or occur in the main dwelling unit, that's on you. You don't have a separate connection. So we've actually waived that that portion of uh, the engineering code for a separate connection for meters. Yeah, and the same is true for us. We allow the, the same connection. Okay, great. Um, have there been any implications regarding uh, from the assessors or taxation issues in either community? Again, I, I, you know, it's not a question I've recently asked our assessor's department, but when they do come through with the building permit and they have acknowledged that it is an ADU, uh, you know, and I think when, when one of the questions when it said uh, primary residential exemption, we know it's a rental now, you're going to be assessed differently. So you know, that, that's how we've dealt with the, you know, the taxation and the assessing of the ADU. Yeah, same with us. Um, and that's another reason why we, we also require a, an annual license to rent it out so we can keep tabs. Are you renting it out still? Things like that for, for tax purposes. Okay. As far as addressing uh, these units, what scheme do you use for ADUs versus the principal structure? Yeah, that's a great question because that's actually become a problem recently. So our addressing goes through the county. Um, the county recently got a different system and central dispatch with 911 and it no longer wants to recognize like A and B units or halves. So what they're what what's happening is when someone builds a ADU at 313 Elm Street, um, 
that ADU gets a new address, 315 Elm Street. Well, the house that was 315 now changes and the rest of the block all changes. And so that gets, we've had quite a few complaints on that. Again, that's kind of beyond our control. It's coming from the county and how they do their addressing to, to parallel with their 911 system. But um, I can see why people are frustrated. They now have to go through and change a lot of different documents and things like that. Yeah, the city has a, a GIS, which is a Geographic Information System Coordinator. He looks at those and he looks at all the surrounding addresses and he does the same thing. He, We've had so few, so it hasn't been an issue, but he will go through and re-address and assign addresses to those accessory structures. Okay. Uh, when ADUs are built uh, and are utilized by adult children, uh, is the property still considered a rental in your communities? That's a good question. Uh, you know, if, if, because they may not be charging rent, is it an? I mean, they still have to come in for review and get a building permit, and we're going to consider it an ADU and get it in, in, inspected um, through our housing department. So, you know, whether they're charging rent or not, I don't think that's any. I haven't heard of anybody not charging rent for them after they've constructed them. But I have also heard from from a lot of uh, homeowners that would like to have, you know, whether it's their mother-in-law or son or daughter live there. Uh, Yes, they, it still would have to be registered as a rental, at least for future cases too, as, a, as an ADU. Yeah, I would say all the same with us here in Traverse City. Okay, um, going back to the housing, are you finding, uh, or maybe it's even anecdotally, but um, is this helping with your housing demand issues for that missing middle housing, affordability? Um, what's your sense on that? Um, well, the only thing of all those things that we propose that we really allow that's missing middle would be the the ADUs. Um, and again, 90 of them hasn't really moved the needle too much, I'd say, here in the city. Uh, as far as affordability, I think that's, we, we still got to get more supply before we get there. Um, and the new construction costs, I mean, it's just it pencils out at a very high monthly rate just for any, really any type of dwelling. Yeah, this is just a a, a real small tool in our toolbox. I, I don't think it's a, addressed any type of affordability issues because if you build something that's at least probably $150,000, you're still getting pretty high rents in these ADUs. Um, you know, as a side <laughs> note, I, I would say in Ann Arbor, I was just at a, a planning commission meeting last night and what I'm seeing somewhat recently to address our affordability is we're building high rises like crazy. Everybody, it's, everybody is now coming in on these R4 type of lots, which is a multifamily residential, whether it's even close to downtown or it's on the periphery. Uh, we are just, I think the makeup of our city council and our planning commission is we, we you know, we've got a, a lot that's, that's uh, I think an R4C, and it would allow up to seven units because it's a like a 16,000 uh, square foot lot. He's, they're proposing an eight story, 100 unit high rise on that same lot. And I will tell you, it looked very, very favorable that we're going to rezone this uh, and, you know, put up a high rise on something that would previously, you know, only allow maybe seven units. So I think the city's direction, you know, the ADUs are great, but we're building higher. There's no question they're starting to just build higher and more dense density. Okay. Yeah, I would agree with that too, just to parallel. I mean, I think that's probably the economy of scale too for like these developers. You know, it doesn't make much sense to build a quadplex when in our multifamily districts, um, we don't have density limits anymore. We got rid of them. We just regulate the size of the building. Uh, so that's where they're kind of gravitating towards is these uh, larger, denser properties. Okay. Can you explain how the cap of 15 are allowed in the waiting list? Uh, do you reapprove each year? How does that work if you have lived there for five years? Can you deny them and allow someone else to build an ADU? No, I mean, we just keep track um, chronologically when people came in to apply. So like we we haven't hit that cap since 2017, I think it was. So what we would do is we'd come in, we'd issue the permits as they came to us, the, the plan sets. Um, and then once we hit 10, we keep track of the names and the date that they applied. And then once the next calendar year started, that guy, that person would be at the top of the list and we'd go through until we hit 10 and then it would carry over to the next year. Okay. And uh, I guess for both of you, what is your average fine if you find an unlicensed ADU? 
Um, ours is $500 a day at the magistrate's discretion though. Same with us. And I will tell you, I've been to court a couple of times, not for the ADUs, but for over occupancy. They never get the $500 fine. It's a first time offense. Uh, you put in way more resources to get a hundred dollar fine and, it, you know, but yeah, it's the same thing. I think it's up to $500. You could get, you know, it's a misdemeanor and maybe at $500 a day, but they drop all of that and it's never more than a hundred, 200 bucks at most. And we that only, many people probably know that, but we only get a third of that. So when they drop it down to a hundred and we get $33 back to the city, but we've invested yep. five hours of documenting that it's illicit. Um, yeah. Of course, okay. money money losing effort. Right. Do you have any restrictions on upper story decks and patios on detached ADUs, especially those located close to property lines from a privacy standpoint? No, we we do not. Um, we we had one where some neighbors complained about it, and you know, at the end of the day, we don't have any similar requirements for the principal structure, so. It's kind of begs the question, why does one person need to have their deck regulated more than the other? Um, so now we we steered away from that. Okay. And we're we're somewhat similar. What I didn't mention in my presentation is we do also, you know, these if it's a detached accessory structure, it still can't take up more than 35% of your rear yard. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's still got to meet, you know, you know, typically a five foot side and rear setback. So if you were in the, the corner of the yard, you couldn't put a deck on it because you still have to be, our decks require that they're three feet from the side and your property line. So it all depends on the location of where, where that accessory, detached accessory dwelling unit is. And then, yeah, you could you put a deck on it if it's meeting all of our setback codes? Sure. And what we try to also, you know, emphasize with the neighbors or at least the individual, if this looks like it really is looking into somebody's house, the way you've built it, or, you know, something that looks like it's an invasion of privacy, please put some landscaping up or a fence, something that you can at least do some screening there, some trees, something. So, you know, you get along with your neighbor. Okay. Is it always existing homes building these ADUs or do you have new builds uh, building them at the same time? Yeah, so we we get new builds. It's primarily existing homes, but just on the block for me was a vacant lot that this past summer, they built a new home with a detached ADU above a garage. That, that's just likewise. I would say all of them have been in existing homes, but it sure seems like when people are coming in and doing a land division and have a vacant parcel, they are really inquiring about, can I put a duplex or can I put an ADU there? And if the answer is yes. So we're hoping that that opens it up, that more will actually start applying on vacant lots for ADUs. Okay. Yeah. And so, just so to I build on that real quick. Um, we don't have a lot of vacant lots in our residential, which is why the planning commission supported reducing minimum lot depth and width a little bit to get a few extra land divisions out there so we can start triggering more, more property development. Okay, there's a follow-up on that. Uh, this person's working with the city to potentially approve ADUs with new builds, but not necessarily build the ADU right away. Uh, so there would be, in essence, a, an approval standing for a future ADU when needed. Uh, any comments to that approach? Mm, yeah, we have not run into that yet. Um, I think where that would be problematic with the person requesting it is would they be able to get their certificate of occupancy to close out the, the, the permits and the financing and stuff like that if they're still part of the approved plans not developed yet? Yeah, it, it's, it's kind of interesting. I just had a call yesterday from a gentleman who, who built a garage in 2015 and he called yesterday saying, listen, you know, I didn't know if those ADU amendments were going to get approved. So I had it all, you know, I had the plumbing and I've got it all set up for an ADU, but I just never finished it. So, you know, six or seven years later, he's calling saying, if I finish it off, I've, you know, can I, you know, pull the permit and get this as a regulated ADU? And my response is, yeah, yeah, you may have started something and you want to convert it or it never was. By all means, convert it into an ADU. Okay, then we had a, this uh, kind of a, an overall question actually directed to me, but are there communities in Oakland County that you know of that are good examples of encouraging ADUs? Uh, and we did uh, send out a recent uh, survey to Oakland County communities about tiny homes, but not specific to ADUs. Um, 
And so that's, that's something we are looking into uh, as we speak uh, to see if there are communities out there that are actually encouraging these. So if, if there are any communities on the call on the Zoom right now that um, actually do, you can throw that in the chat uh, for everyone to, uh, to be able to see. Maybe they can uh, have a conversation with you directly. If there are any other questions, you could see them in the, in the chat. I would also add on to that, that Jim, that, that call comes in quite a bit. You know, the inquiry is, well, what about a tiny home on wheels? Can we just, you know, install something like that in their rear property? And the answer is no. It can't be mobile. It's got to be hooked up. You know, you're going to have to hook it up to water and sewer and, you know, utilities. So we don't allow, you know, a, a tiny home on wheels. Okay. Another question here is, what if you finish the ADU uh, and then get denied the application? I'm thinking they might be referring to a licensing versus versus permitting. Yeah, we have not um, had that happen. We verify with the clerk's office before we issue the land use permit that there is a license available and that they they meet all the license requirements with their proposed plan. So they're kind of permitted together. Okay. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not real sure I understood the question correctly. But if I do it, you know, the process is you're you're gonna. The first thing you do is probably call the zoning coordinator or a planner to find out. You know, you know, show us a, a conceptual drawing of what you're proposing. Then it needs to get a building permit and a zoning review. And then if you're you know renting it out, then it goes over to the housing department. So before any of uh, this gets a, before they even receive a, a building permit. It's going to go through three levels, you know, of scrutiny to make sure that it's meeting all of the rental codes, the building codes, and the zoning codes. Okay. All right. Okay, that is all that I see in the chat box for questions. Uh, give it one more minute. Um, again, I want to thank both of you, gentlemen. Excellent presentation. Um, very good discussion and filled in a lot of the gaps, I know, for me. I uh, don't see any other questions. So, uh, Ryan, I think we can uh, close it out. Yeah, so again, thank you both, Sean and, and Chris, for, for presenting today. And thanks, uh, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in a couple of months uh, with the next installment of our virtual planners gathering. Take care, everyone.